The title of my message is Having an Eternal Perspective. You know, God created us to be eternal beings. Our bodies one day will perish, but our spirit will return back to God. And this is what the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, forms the human spirit within a person. Now I want you to look at that verse. The God who, who laid out or stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations, formed the human spirit in a person. Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, says this in chapter 12, verse 7, Then the dust will return to, to the dust as it was, and the spirit, our human spirit, will return to God who gave it. So just as our bodies will go back to the dust, our spirit, that's who you are, is in your spirit, will return back to God. Now in the following verse, Solomon says this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless. Now Solomon realizes that in the light of eternity, knowing that his spirit will one day go back to God, his body will go back to the dust, all the wealth he accumulated, the fame he had, will all come to an end. There's nothing he could take with him. So it's in that context, he looks back at his life and says, meaningless, meaningless. Or another translation says, vanity, vanity. Everything is vanity. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7 says, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So everyone will die, we are certain about it. And just as we are certain about that, we must be certain that the judgment will take place. There will be a judgment. Every man, every woman, every child will have to give an account or be answerable to God for how you lived your life on the earth from the time you were born till the time you die. Now we hear a lot of messages on the second coming and we have some exciting uh, events that happen in order to show us when Jesus will come. But now that's a mystery. No one knows the time and the hour when Jesus will come. But yet, Jesus spoke more about the eternal judgment than any other topic in the Gospels. And now that's a revelation for us to understand. And if you read the Gospel, you will be amazed how many times Jesus draws their attention in order for them to prepare for eternity. So when Jesus talks about eternal judgment, he's not talking to scare us or frighten us, but he's talking about it so that we will be prepared for that day. Now, if you're going to do an exam, how many of you would like an advance notice before the exams? Put your hand up. Yeah, that's obvious. The time frame we have, we will capitalize. We will put in hours of study just to prepare for that exam. Now, there is an examination that's going to happen, and that examination will happen at the day of judgment, where we could prepare. Jesus prepares us. He talks about, it, about this in parables, so many parables, so that we could have a futuristic perspective of the way we live our present life. Now the people in the days of the apostles were saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep or they died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And so this apostle Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. If the second coming and the judgment has not yet come, it is only because God is long-suffering. He is patient. He wants everyone in this world to know that, uh, what salvation is all about. So this morning, we're going to look at just 
five areas quickly where we would be answerable to God on that great and glorious day. This will be the most important day in the history of mankind when Jesus comes and we are held accountable for the way we have lived. Now, I'm being very gracious this morning. You know, when you have an exam and you don't know the questions, you're always nervous what the questions will be. But I'm going to give you the questions this morning so that you can prepare well in advance with your answer when you stand before God. And if I hear you on that day saying, I never knew, I will shout from wherever I am. I told them, but they never listen. Are you with me? So give people a nice uh, uh, loving dig and saying, are you listening? These are the five areas, these are the five questions you will have to answer for on that great and glorious day. And so if you're wise, you'll take down the question paper and you will prepare for it, well prepare for it, so that you will have the right answers. The first question would be concerning our possessions. There are five, this is the first one, concerning our possessions. Now there, there was a person in Luke chapter 12 who was in the crowd and asked Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Isn't that a common problem with inheritance? And says, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter before, between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So this is what Jesus' answer, and I don't know how helpful it was for him. He says, watch out for greed. Because greed is not just in regards to money, it can be anything. Watch out for greed. All kinds of greed. We can be greedy over food. We can be greedy over food. We can be greedy over shoes. Some people have a whole rack of shoes. They can open a, a shoe shop. We can be greedy with, with just clothes, with gadgets. All kinds of greed. Be careful because life doesn't consist of, of the abundance of your possessions, of what you have. Then Jesus goes on to tell a parable. And Jesus loved telling stories of a rich man whose land yielded an abundant harvest. So the rich man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. You know. Let's not put this in Bible or oh, that guy. <laughs> Same to us. You open your cupboard, I have no place to put my clothes. You have no place to put your shoes. You have no place. That means you have too much. So here's this person, the Bible saying, he had an abundance of a harvest. His one problem is, where will I store all this grain? So he tore down his barns, built bigger ones to store up a surplus gain. Then in verse 19, he says to himself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. It's the next generation and next generation. Many years, grain is stored up. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I'm glad no one shouted an amen. But somehow, there is that dream in most people's hearts. I will save up enough of money, and then I will relax. I will take life easy. I will travel the world. I can just do this, and I can do that. This was a person that Jesus is talking about in a parable who had a framework of mind, thinking he can bank on his possessions because he can relax and take life easy. In Luke chapter 12, verse 20, God said something to him, you fool. Can you believe God saying that to anybody? This very night your, your, your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. 
This, can we, read, can we read this together? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Did you read that? So now Jesus gives us a parable, and then that parable has a punchline which is relevant for every generation. And this is about us. It's not about the rich man and the parable, but it's about us. When I was reading this passage, I was thinking, what does this have to do with two brothers fighting over inheritance? What has it got to do? Two guys fighting for their inheritance. He says, he's not giving my share. And Jesus tells this parable. And then I realized that this parable is not about being rich, but it's about Jesus warning us against all kinds of greed. He says, be careful of it. This parable is not about how much you have, but it is what you do with what you have. Can somebody shout an amen? Now, that was not very loud. Can I hear a loud amen? It's not about what you have, it's what you do with what you have. That's why the Bible says, we be, wo, wo to them, or whatever he, Jesus was saying in the parable, store some things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. There's no heaven perspective with the possessions that you have. You know, it's so easy to get attached to people and to possessions. God wants us to be detached from these two things so that we have a bonding and a rely on him. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26 to 27, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit, his, forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul or for their life? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels. And then, and then He will reward each person according to what they have. What they have. Can I hear that loudly? What they have done. So sitting back and being a good Christian is not good enough. You can't give that answer to God and saying, I did nothing. You blessed me. I kept it. No, he blessed you for a purpose. And what will ask you, what have you done? Look at your person, neighbor, and smile and say, you have enough. You have enough, more than enough to do something with what you got. True? Ah. Oh. Okay, the second question. This is your second question that will be there when you go before God. This will be concerning your service. Now, there was a division in the Corinthian church, so they also had divisions. People in the congregation were fighting. They were quarreling rather, and they were saying to each other, I follow Paul and others. And the other said, I follow Apollos. I like Pastor Victor, I don't like the other one. I like that worship leader, I don't like this worship leader. Something like that the Corinthian church was, uh, was quarreling about. Yeah, getting the context? Mm. And so the Apostle Paul says this, addresses this problem by saying to them, who then is Paul? Who is Apostle? A Apollos? But ministers, the word minister means servants. We're not, we're their servants through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. So if you believed, it's because the Lord's intervention was in your life. We're only servants to serve God's purposes. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. How true that is. In every single one, has their job description, either it is sowing, either it is planting, or it is reaping, but the increase comes from God. That's it. Then it goes on, he goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 7, same chapter, so then neither he who plants in anything is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. There's nothing to boast about. What you have is God's blessing. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one, can you say each one, 
will receive his own reward according to his own labor. You know, people there at the back, helping, serving around, people helping in the worship, whatever you do, it takes a combined effort to do according to what God has assigned for you. But in the end, God will reward you accordingly, according to what he's entrusted to you. We all have a measure of grace to do things. It goes on in verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers, working with God. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another, one, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the solid foundation, the person of Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, hay and hay straw, each one's work, each one's work, that means what you do, each one's work will become very clear. For the day will declare it. The day will reveal the quality of your work because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's what? Each one's of what sort it is. You know, you, you notice about Jesus, he never likes idle people hanging around. The whole context of hanging around doesn't appear in Jesus' uh, frame of thinking. Hello? Each and every person has a work to do. Why did the Bible talk about gold, silver, and precious stones? When gold, silver, and precious stone goes through fire, it becomes better. When wood, hay, and straw goes to fire, it vanishes. How do we know whether we're doing the right thing that produces gold? It's not what just what we do. It's the motives behind what we do that matter, whether it's gold, silver, or precious stones. On the day of judgment, our works or our service will be tested by fire. Our motives will be revealed. If we have the right attitude to glorify God, we will pass the test. Look at what verse 14 says. If, any man, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So, you know, when we know Jesus as our Savior, we pass from eternal damnation to eternal life, and that's certain. But we face a judgment, and this judgment is not about hell and heaven. This judgment is about what we have done with our life and what we have done with the things that God has entrusted with you. How much you have worked for the kingdom, served the kingdom. The third question this morning, is concerning our relationships with our one another. How do we relate with one another? All with an eternal perspective. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, reading from the Living uh, Translation. So do not make judgments about anyone ahead of time. Don't make judgments. Why? Before the Lord returns, the Lord will come. For he will bring out the darkest secrets to light and will reveal your private motives. You see the screen here? Everything I do, you can see here. Judgment day is going to be like that. Only thing, you won't see the physical aspect, you will see the motives and the attitudes come out. And then, ah, you actually taught this about me? Your darkest secrets. So forget about your, your neighbor knowing. Hmm. Everyone will know. It says the darkest secrets to light and will reveal your private motives. Then God will give to each one whether, whether praise is due. In Romans chapter 14 verse 10 says, but, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt to your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let God be the judge. 
That's like, he knows the heart, he knows the motives and the attitudes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another. You know what that spur is? If you, you've seen a jockey, a jockey will have a spur behind their, their heel and they keep goading the horse. And now the Bible is saying, using the same word, let us goad one another. So when I tell you to give a person a nudge, it's very scriptural. Only thing, we're not doing it with the heel, we're doing it with the elbow. It's a spur one another towards love and good deeds. Get people to do something good. Not giving up meeting together, as fellowshipping with one another, as some are in the habit of doing. Now we have live stream, so it makes it convenient for people to sit at home and watch. You're listening to me. God bless you. I'm glad. I would love to see your face personally. Lovely people you all are. But encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Why is D capital? It's referring to D day, the day of judgment, eternal judgment. Why is it called eternal judgment? Because that's the final pronouncement, and nothing can change it. We will live in the rest of the, uh, for the rest of eternity based on how we are evaluated by the life we lived here on earth. The fourth one, so I'm coming close. The fourth one is our attitude towards the poor and the needy. Now, I'm not going to explain much. You probably know this parable, but I'm highlighting it again because Jesus said it in the context of eternity. When the Son of Man comes, Jesus, he's talking about Jesus, he will come in his glory. You can picture that. All the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Who's on his right? Who's on the left? Okay. In verse 37, when the righteous will answer to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Then the king will reply, truly, I tell you, what Whatever, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. You know, many years ago, I, uh, we as a church, we said, if a visitor came home, how many of you would like to bake a, uh, no, bake a cake for them and serve them? Put your hand up. Okay. Let me tell you, what if Jesus came home? What would you do? You will bake the best cake? Yes? You will keep everything even more, much better than cake. Now the same thing you do with Jesus, for Jesus, when you see a little one, a person who's poor, give it to them and say, this is for you, Jesus. We have something that we would do in Radiant School of Learning, bake a cake for Jesus. And then people will celebrate their birthdays and come to the school and distribute it. Why? Heaven's perspective. What is it? The question will come on your examination day. What did we do? He says, whatever you do. They were surprised. They didn't do it knowing that one day Jesus will reward them. They did it because they were convicted in their heart that this was the right thing. And they went out and blessed others. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from you, you who are cursed into the eternal fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. What was prepared for the devil and his angels? Uh, he'll have company. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Then they will also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in pr or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer saying, Assuredly I say to you, as in as, mu in as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it for me. And so we have a brilliant opportunity all the time in our nation to do something. It's our responsibility. 
In verse 46, then these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into, can you say what the righteous will go into? The righteous is righteous, not by not doing things. Somehow the Christian world has defined righteousness by, not, by the negative. I don't drink, I don't smoke. Who is blessed? You're impressing yourself, no one else. Oh, I don't swear, I don't do this. So, none of that question comes into, into this question paper. Jesus will not ask you, you never drank, you never smoked. Who, he never, never committed adultery. Angels, he never committed adultery. That will never be in your question paper. You came to the final exam because of Jesus. And now Jesus is saying, what did you do with what I've given you? What wing have you served? What was your attitude towards one another? Have you had, have, do you have a judgmental attitude? Every second person who comes your, across your path, you criticize. Every person that hurts you, you pass a judgment over them. That will be revealed. There we are surrounded with people. We are surrounded with opportunities. Have we gone insensitive to others? Or we have conditioned our heart knowing that there is a responsibility that we have before God. And I've come to the last one. The last one is a question about our character. Our character. That's the last question. Now Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said to, you, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now Jesus took it a notch up. Old Testament, if they were caught in the act of adultery, they were penalized and they were stoned to death. In the New Testament, God says, looking with a, at a woman, oh, okay, women applies to you looking at men with a lustful heart, okay? He says, you've already sinned in your heart. Verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, he looked at a woman with one eye or a man with, I'm just joking. But if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. If it is, for it is more profitable for you than one of your members perish, that means have no eye, than for your whole body to be cast in hell. You know what I see Jesus doing here? He gives them a radical approach to sin now. And he gives them an eternal motivation for the future. What a way to handle, deal with things. We don't deal with it only from an earthly perspective. We deal with areas of our life with an eternal perspective. Now, please don't go pulling your eye out. Uh, next, I'll read the next verse and it goes on further. Jesus is emphasizing. It says here in verse uh, 30, And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you. He's emphasizing another part of your body. For it is more profitable for you than one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. You know, the two things that we use to sin is our eye and our hands. Isn't it true? I would wonder why he didn't talk about the tongue. I feel like adding that into, no, I can't do that. But basically what Jesus is saying, be radical with sin. What is he saying? Say it loudly, what is Jesus saying? Be so radical with sin and saying, no, I'm going to take a stand. You're not counting the cost of what you're giving up. You're going to count the cost of what you're gaining. You're gaining freedom and you're gaining eternity. And in the light of that, Jesus is saying, take a radical approach. Jesus gives us an idea of what the last days will be like in Matthew chapter 24, 36 to 39. But of that day and hour, no one knows. No one knows the time and the hour. Not even the angels of heaven. So stop guessing when Jesus will come. Of course, there are circumstances. Hey, you know what? We shifted the goalpost. We made the second coming everything. We get so excited hearing messages about the second coming. Hey, but that's not the issue. The issue is he's coming in order to judge us. 
And so let's not be too excited of when he's coming and how he's coming and where he's coming. But let's prepare for the exam and the examination. He will examine our hearts. He will, our motives, our attitudes, our life, our deeds will all be revealed on that day. Do you know what I learned from this study? That there are more, far more scriptures that Jesus talks about eternal judgment and eternity than his coming again. Read the Gospels and see. Suddenly my eyes opened. I said, almost every parable, there is an earthly application and there's also an eternal perspective that Jesus gives us. Almost everything. So, when you read the Gospels, be open to look for those verses in those parables. And so Jesus is saying this. His coming, people will, no one knows when he will come. Only my Father in heaven. But he gives us what will happen. What will be, what will be the state of the world when Jesus comes? But as, the, but as the last days of Noah were. Are you with me so far? Are you listening to me? History repeats itself. History repeats itself. If we don't watch out. Jesus takes them back right to those days of Noah. Why did Jesus use Noah as an example? Let's read. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, before God could pour out the flood, what was that? Eating? Second one? Away, I must say, you say. What's the second one? This is not drinking water or coffee. You know, intoxicating drink. Eating, drinking. What else did they do? Marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. Right up to the day. It's not that Noah didn't want them. Noah was proclaiming, and you will find that in other verses. I'm not quoting it, but it's there in the Bible. He warned them. God used them as his messenger. No one took notice. They carried on life as usual. I want everyone's attention here this morning. We can go back from the service living life as usual, or we can get our act together, and we can start living in the light of, in the light of eternity. Somebody shout an amen. This calls for a change. This calls for a radical living in this world. In the midst of eating, drinking, all these things happening, there are godly men and women that will bear the message of the cross. Then it goes on to say, And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also, what does it say? so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. It will be a surprise to those who didn't prepare. I'm giving you the question paper. I trust you'll prepare. My name is not Noah, but the word is the same. Look at verse 20, uh, Matthew 22, 44. Therefore, also, you also be what? Ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. One Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, addresses an, an attitude of what people will have concerning Jesus and concerning His coming. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, the days we are living in are the last days. Scoffers will come. They will scoff. They will make fun of your righteousness. They will make fun of your lifestyle. They will make fun because you didn't join them in doing what they wanted. Scoffing and following their own desires. Heroes of today are ones who do wrong, not the right. In fact, those who do wrong are celebrated. Those who, are, who live righteously are looked down and despised and scoffed at. They will say, 
Where is the coming he promised? Where? Look, generations have come and gone. Don't be too caught up with his coming and eternal judgment. Where will, will this coming be promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it was since the beginning of creation. That's the logic. But then one, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5. The apostle says this. The Bible says this. They deliberately forgot Deliberately, my church, they forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. And the earth was formed out of water, and by water, God created it by his word. By these waters also, the world of that time was del deluged and destroyed, just by his word. Not only created, also there was destruction. Now look at verse 7. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. Being kept for the day of judgment and destruction for the ungodly. So, stop entertaining yourself about Jesus' coming when and what. Oh, you know earthquakes, the Bible says earthquakes is there. People are studying uh, the, the, the geographical uh, signs of Jesus' coming. There will be walk. Oh, they're kidding. Oh, they're oh, second coming. It's not about him coming. The question here this morning is, are we prepared for his coming? His coming will be the final exam. And whatever is decided on that day will determine the rest of eternity.